All right, everybody. So we have Steve Hall back on from Revive Stronger. How's it going, Steve? Yeah, I'm, pre I'm pretty good, all things considered. Uh, I can't complain too hard. I know we we're just talking <laughs> about how I've not been, uh, I've been suffering, I guess, some sort of ailments. I don't know exactly what they are at the moment, but all things considered, my life is going pretty well. So I, I don't like to say like, oh, it's going okay. I want to be positive because overall, right, right. big picture stuff, like it's Could going very well. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much for having me on again. Absolutely, man. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to kind of start recording because obviously we were starting to talk a little bit, but I thought that might be good for people to hear. Um, so one thing we were talking about is you're you're what like around two hundred pounds right now. Yeah, and that's pretty much the heaviest you've been, right? Yeah, the heaviest I'd ever got to before uh, was one hundred ninety pounds. So oh, okay, I that's kind a of pretty big jump. Yeah, it's a big jump, and I actually managed to get to. I'm hovering like just over two hundred. So I, I kind of hit two hundred. Like yeah. months ago, and I like mm -hmm. basically got one way in at 200. I was like, yeah, I hit 200. <laughs> Whereas now I'm like an established 200. Like Actually I'm not. Yeah. I haven't had a way in lower than 200 in like a couple of months now. So wow. Okay. So what what's been going on? Like what's the issues that you're facing? So for the far past like four months, I had been really struggling with my appetite, um, and I had. I mean, the, the appetite and a bit of fatigue has been kicking in, like in the mornings, particularly has been quite bad. But like four months ago, I just thought it was like peak mass, lack of appetite, just right. being like a bit of just need to man up and eat more or whatever it might be, yeah. have like more liquid calories, all that sort of jazz. And I'd been planning to kind of finish a mass and go into a mini cut because I was like fed up, I couldn't keep eating. But mm -hmm. I had like a consultation with Jared Feather uh, from Renaissance Periodization. He was like, a mini cut doesn't make sense in your long term plan right now. Continue massing. And mm -hmm. so I did. And I bought like serious mass, which for those who don't know, it's like over a thousand calories for a serving. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. And I've gone through, I think, two like five kilo bags and two <laughs> like two kilo tubs. Um, How's and it it's it's uh everything tastes pretty shit at the moment to yeah, be quite right, honest with you right. <laughs> i'm not enjoying food at all so yeah i i thought it was that but after the last kind of month it things had got much tougher i was like properly nauseous i haven't been sick um but fatigue had also been picking up and i was just like this just doesn't seem right so i saw my gp they did some blood tests and stool tests nothing came of that yeah. i did some home tests of like just general like um what's it called, white blood counts and red blood counts and everything, just to see if I, there was anything underlying going on. They were all fine, which is really good because that means it's hopefully nothing too serious that's wrong with yeah. me. And uh, I went to the GP again, and I also, in that time, there was like quite a long time, like it takes a long time to like book in with the NHS and everything and get, yeah, get yeah. seen. So in that time, I would actually put it out on like my Instagram, and I had, I think, three GPs or doctors reach out to me and said, like, think about GERD um, mm -hmm. or think about like acid reflux. And someone reached out to me saying they had the exact same symptoms, which is basically like t fatigue and nausea in the mornings. And they had been taking omeprazole, I think, which yeah, is like a protein, yeah, pr protein pump inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And because uh, basically overstimulating acid, um, like gastrointestinal acids and overnight that's kind of building up. And then in yeah. the morning is why I'm feeling the way I feel. That's kind of what they thought. So I took those and I've been taking those for like the last five, I don't know, basically a week now. It'll be a week today. And they initially seemed to be helping. And now they seem to not have be doing yeah. very much for me. So I've been told to continue taking those in two weeks. I have an endoscopy, which is like a camera down the throat and yeah. checking out yeah. everything which I'm not looking forward to, although I did think about it. And this like, is similar, to, well, it's related to you, I guess, because I was like, it's like the dentist kind of, yeah. like, you just open your <laughs> mouth and they go in there for like an yeah. hour and do stuff. So uh, that's in two weeks. And then I've, he also got me to have a ultrasound, which is in like three months or something. So uh, I'm booked in and we'll see what happens. But I've already called it that I think as soon as I start dieting, mm -hmm. that like the reduction in food and kind of, the need for then being hungry and um, all of those sort of aspects, I think I'll just, it will kind of put a bit of a plaster over maybe an underlying yeah. issue, but hopefully the scans will pick something up. But yeah, that's where I've been. It's frustrating, but also like all of these things, I try and take it as a bit of a lesson and a teaching because if I have a client who is right. like complaining in a mass, I might not just think you're just being a pussy, just keep yeah. eating. I might <laughs> think maybe there's I've something more it. going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, a few things on that. Um, 
it is interesting for sure. It's one of the things I talked about with uh, Mike Israel, like one of the first podcasts I did, and how it, it's just amazing how the same person, like when you're dieting, everything seems amazing. All food seems great, and like you can't even imagine not getting to have some of those foods. And when you're bulking up, it's all disgusting. You know, it's, it's just like, it's just so unappealing. Um, and to, you know, yours is obviously an extreme case where you're actually feeling like nauseous all the time. But I've certainly had that. And I've never really bought like the mass gainers, but I've just kind of made my own where it's like I've come home and just, I still need to eat 1,200 calories, but I don't want to eat anything. And I'll just put a shake with peanut butter. And like, I've literally put like oil in there before just because I just wanted the calories. Uh, yeah, it's kind of gross. But um, I mean, that's like a huge thing that a lot of people notice as they try to gain weight. But it's also fascinating just between individuals. Some people, without trying, they become obese, right? And then people like with you where it's like you just can't force yourself to get above a certain weight or, or body fat. You know, your body is just rejecting that. So it's very interesting to see. And I think it is good to kind of go through that experience so that you can understand when somebody is saying like, man, it's so hard this way or that way. You, you've kind of been there yourself to kind of be able to gauge that, you know? Yeah, and I think it's, for me, it's interesting because everyone thinks of, I don't know, like bodybuilding lean and dieting to that level is like, that's not healthy. And mm -hmm. then bulking in general pop, like losing fat's healthy and like gaining weight isn't healthy. But for like bodybuilders, it's thought, oh, the off season's the healthy time and like pushing right, weight up, right. you're getting healthier. Yeah. But it's obvious, I, I don't think I would have experienced what I'm experiencing if I wasn't forced like forcing my body weight up yeah. and getting heavier than maybe my body wants to be and eating an amount of food that my body doesn't want to eat, which is why I think when I start dieting and I lose some weight and everything, it will just kind of settle itself because it'll be like, well, now you're in that like settling range where your body's just happy and you just have like preventative things going on. Like <laughs> you can't get so lean because yeah. whatever your body just will start preventing things. You have similar things when I guess, um, maybe it's different it's obviously different between different individuals but it's like this yeah. is my body telling me yeah you're not getting any bigger although i did manage to go from at the like when i said with i was going to start a mini cut i kind of started massing it just under my weight had dropped a bit because i went through a maintenance period because i was about just under 200 and then i've managed to build up to like 202 203 mm -hmm. i had some weigh-ins and i'm still weighing in around that so i did manage to force my way past yeah. it but it's like yeah. what did i like it for most people I don't know if I had to put a client through some of the days that I went through to just do that. I, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's crazy to think that I don't think I could have done it if I had like a normal job. I just would have felt so terrible. Yeah, for sure. It um, actually feels like torture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like even to get, I have my first meal, I get up at seven and I can't stomach uh, my first meal, which is just the mass gainer until yeah. 10. And then I'm drinking it and I'm just like, this is horrible. And this yeah. is a thousand calories. Like most people would be like, Oh yeah, a thousand calorie milkshake sounds delicious, and I'm just right, like, this is right. torture. Like, I would much prefer just to not eat right now. <laughs> right, for sure. Um, do you take melatonin by chance? I don't. So this is definitely not the standard of care, but it's something that I thought was kind of interesting. So when you take uh, a PPI, you know, like a meprazole, the way it works is it lowers the acidity in your stomach because that acidity is, you know, what you're feeling with that reflux. I've actually read. I think three different studies now, um, actually there might be more than that, on melatonin actually helping reflux, which I had never heard of before until like the last year, because um, I started getting some reflux too. I was, it was when I was doing my kind of keto experiment just to test things out. And I think just having such a high level of fat and everything was causing problems. So it actually, I mean, it could be placebo, but it seemed to help me. But I guess the reasoning behind it is that when you have a PPI, it's lowering the acidity one of the issues with reflux is that the sphincter is not closing. So it's allowing the acid to go up. And mm -hmm. then if you have, apparently melatonin has some effect by closing the sphincter. So wow. it's actually getting to the direct problem because as you, you may know, PPIs, especially long term, can have a lot of yeah. side effects. Um, it's really not something that I'd recommend a lot of people do, you know, for life, but obviously some people do have to. Um, so again, um, you know, for anybody listening, try it. It's a, it's a super easy thing to do you know there's really no like harm in doing it um but again it's not the standard of care i'm sure if you go to your medical doctor they're not going to recommend it or even know about it but if you just you know, really you can just google it and there, there's a few different studies on it that you know had pretty noticeable effects um and they, they seem to actually match the ppi and long term actually seem to be a little bit better um, i can send you the papers if you want but that'd be super interesting i've got melatonin uh, i bought like tons of it because at yeah. one point i was like i'm going to take melatonin 
like every single day and i never did and i took melatonin a few times and didn't see massive benefits but it if it would help, help with sleep. this yeah with if it would help like this like ooh, why not do you know yeah, what the I, amounts might have been um in the studies i think it was i think it was three milligrams i think um, that's what i've got yeah, yeah. so oh, there you go <laughs> But yeah, it didn't, like I said, it didn't help me sleep. That's why I stopped taking it too, because I was like, this doesn't do anything. But when I had the reflux, again, it wasn't like I went from like horrible reflux to like nothing. But I mean, it was, it was actually getting pretty significant for a while. And I don't seem to have it now. So I don't know. I mean, that's an anecdote, but there are, there's some research at least backing up. So give it a shot. I don't know even know if reflux is your only issue right now, but like I guess that doesn't hurt to try it. Yeah, it's even the thing is, I never thought it was reflux because I never experienced it in the day. So. Mm -hmm. It was like, it was just, I assume it's just happening at night or maybe it isn't even happening. I don't know. It's like, yeah, I'm so yeah. lost. So yeah. I've, yeah, I don't kind of get anything major in the day and yeah, I'm not getting any kind of pain or any issues. So yeah, hopefully it's just something small and minor that can be cleared up, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. When I had my, I had an endoscopy for the same reason. I wanted to see if I had reflux and it, it came out fine. Um, but I had a temporary crown on my tooth actually. And they, it broke off when I woke up, it was just like not there. I was like, all right, cool. So, I mean, thankfully for me, <laughs> I, I can take care of it pretty easily, but watch your teeth. <laughs> so they put you asleep when you have an endoscopy or do you I do it away? for mine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I don't, I have no idea how it's going to go. So I was, I was thinking they'd just give me some like painkillers and I'll be awake just like with this tube. <laughs> I don't know if some people do it that way. I certainly didn't have it done that way. So <laughs> it, I kind of want to be awake now, considering you lost like <laughs> some filling. You know? it's not yeah, good. yeah. So you know, when I first reached out to you a couple weeks ago about coming back on, one of the reasons was that if you'd listen to like me or um, you know some other people in this industry talk, I really do believe that for the most part, you know, Lyle McDonald talks about it all the time. Five, six years of doing it right, which is a, a big caveat, doing it right, you know. Um, you're going to have most of your progress. And I, I do believe that, but man, you're like what, 10 years in now? Yeah. And I mean, at least looking at the pictures that you post up, I mean, there are some serious, I mean, you have one that was, it was like 15 pounds and 15 months, something like that. And you look so much bigger and not even like that much fatter. I, I mean, body fat percentage looks pretty similar. Um, yeah. So is there something that you've been doing? I mean, I know, obviously, you're like your general principles. <laughs> Basically, I'm wondering how much trend you're taking. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> and when this big natty said, crap I was is like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> What is going on? That's the real reason you're on today. Um, <laughs> this is the call-out show. So <laughs> just, I guess, in terms of, and especially your legs, actually. Your legs really blew up. I don't know if like, that's something that you've noticed more so. But in the two pictures and a few of like, the side-by-sides, Upper body has improved, but the lower body is like dramatically different. So I don't know if maybe you weren't training your lower body as hard before and that's changed. I, I kind of just wanted to hear what you've been doing. So I would say, first of all, to caveat the photos, I think probably they were taken at different angles. Uh, I at least know the more recent ones were taken like from like a gym bench within a changing room. So it was like from the below and to up. So maybe that made my legs look more impressive than maybe they have like gained. I'd also say I'm fortunate in that I hold body fat quite evenly on my physique. So I think I can look similar body fat percentages, but I've just kind of like my fat, my legs, sorry, my fat, my legs look fat and they just like, they look, they're not looking fatter. They're just looking bigger, but mm -hmm. you, they're probably yeah. quite a bit fatter. So I'd say those things probably contribute to it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I have been doing anything different. My entire off season has been just the same and very consistently doing the same things out like every single time. The only time I've really messed with anything necessarily is in the last um, two mesocycles I did, I focused on quads and back and I trained other muscle groups at like minimum effective volume and stabilized their volume. But I wouldn't say that that would have had a huge difference. Um, but yeah, I, I can't pinpoint that I've done anything necessarily different. I've just continued to take care of all the details. Uh, I know kind of like nutrient timing and sleep and stress management and just being consistent in the gym and auto-regulating my volume and being very kind of on top of that. That's what I've been doing. Um, I haven't yeah. implemented anything different. I haven't changed anything in my life. Um, those are just the things I've been doing day in, day out. And it's just been a consistent approach at doing that. What's the difference between your minimum effective volume that you're doing for those other muscle groups and, you know, how high you're bringing the volume for quads and back? So I'd have to look. 
because this is something that I always I just put it into my uh, my like Google spreadsheet and I just let it go and I just yeah. go through the motions. Uh, my minimum effective volume I tend to keep at around the same sort of level from mesocycle to mesocycle. I don't tend I don't like know it off the top of my head, but I think my chest volume was at maybe something around ten sets or something. Uh, along those lines, my back would have started out closer to 14, 15 sets and got up to maybe just below 30. Um, I was training. The only oh, wow. thing I did change, actually, actually, this is something I changed. So um, I was been following a push-pull leg split for like the majority of my off-season. But in the last, um, the last, I think, three, five mesocycles I've done have been upper, lower, upper, lower, upper, lower. So three times per week frequency on all the kind of big major muscle groups. So that did allow my volume to be higher uh, because I was spreading it over more sessions and I had to undulate things more. So I also included more higher repetition work. So mm. that also could have influenced things. So now you're asking me actually, what did I change? So these yeah. are definitely some things I changed. So I definitely implemented higher training frequency and I definitely implemented higher repetition work that I wasn't doing previously. I think before I maybe worked up to like reps of 20, but I never went above that really. Whereas now I've started including more regularly sets of like 20 to 30. Wow. So these, I mean, your MEVs that you're talking about are, are still, I mean, I would say high, high, but I mean, they're, they're not low. So what, are those volumes the you're hoping to still make some progress on or just keep at maintenance? Because I mean, just personally, I feel like I can maintain on very little. Um, to make progress, it's, it's a big jump. I mean, right now I'm trying to do an overhead press specialization, so it's more of a strength goal. But I'm probably going to be doing, geez, I don't know, 20 sets of it over the course of the week. But in terms of just maintaining, I mean, I've maintained chest strength, like I'm literally talking like two to four sets in a week. It's pretty dramatic. So is, is, are you still trying to like, progress on those other um, movements? Or is it just kind of like you live? They just want to be at maintenance so definitely i i can just i think i got your question um they're they're meant okay. to be at minimum effective volume and not maintenance so i'm still trying to progress with those okay. just at a much slower pace and i may have i may be at a point where i that's not even suitable or at least maybe at the point i am right now in my mass where i was just not feeling particularly great like my fatigue and the kind of the gastric reflux or whatever it is kind of held me back so i think i would have done better if i'd actually put things down to maintenance volume and then push the others up um, but previously to the last two mesocycles i had been taking everything uh, as best as i could and as best to my knowledge from minimum effective all the way up to mrv and yeah just pursuing that Nice, nice. I was going to ask, in terms of your strength, I mean, you know, we talk about like volume a lot. Obviously, your goal is hypertrophy. Uh, you obviously compete in bodybuilding. But how much are you noticing your strength going up on not necessarily like new movements that you pick, because obviously those are going to go up just from the, neuro, you know, the neurological factors, but big lifts that you've been doing for years and years, how much are those going up relative to like what they were previously maxed at? Yeah. So it's actually interesting. I don't focus a whole lot on at least month and uh, week to week strength. I just kind of go through the motions and it's normally I'm working with kind of, and it's probably the same for you, like it's weights you've done before and you're just, it's overloading to you, but it's not kind of a progressive overload necessarily mm -hmm. for you. So the majority of the time I'm doing that and I don't actually focus too much on like hitting PRs and knowing that I've done that. They just kind of come to me as I'm going through the mm -hmm. process which is kind of counter to a lot of people who focus on like progressive overload and having to kind yeah. of hit new strength goals and hit PRs quite frequently. But I've just found that process to be better for me and also took my ego out of the lifts a little bit because I did find myself getting, like, especially when I, I cycled in deadlifts for a period of time, like a year ago, and I was just getting so focused on the amount of weight I was doing and not really thinking about sure. how's this kind of providing me stimulus for muscle hypertrophy. So... Um, in terms of those, I'd say the only lift I've been like, sh I've been shocking myself with is bench press and I'm not a strong bencher and I never mm. have been, but that's the one lift I was like, Oh, it's actually increasing kind of pretty decently. But most of the time I'm only increasing, like if I was doing a squat mesocycle to mesocycle, it might go up by two and a half kilos. So if I'm doing mm. like, I might do this exact same mesocycle process but i'm doing every single week with two and a half kilos more or an extra rep more that's how i tend to end up yeah. progressing mesocycle to mesocycle yeah, yeah. 
after maybe six mesocycles, it's now like stalling and I'm lucky if I'm continuing to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's still solid after the amount of time you've put into it. I think it, it is hard to take the ego out of it. And it's just as somebody who spent the majority of his time lifting, pushing for those PRs, it, that was one of the issues I had with keeping reps in reserve because it would be like, okay, so this week, you know, let's say I just did like 225 for 10 and it's like a two RIR, right? And next week I do 225 for 10 and it's still a two RIR. And I'm like, okay, but I can push more. So for the progress, I want to do 11 so that I can say I beat last week, even though it, I only beat last week because it was harder, you know, and then the next week I could get 12 and then I'd be done. You know, I'm stalled now. And, and so it's very hard to see, like, I could progress if I just pushed harder to failure or if I just, you know, loosened up form a little bit, you know, you just want to see those numbers go up. Um, it's always, even now, it's still a hard thing to not push when you know, like, oh, I could just eke that out, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. It's something that's taken me a long time, especially on like lifts that I love to be able to do lots of load on like a squat or something. And I find it hard to hold myself back in the first week, but I try and remind myself that like I have to think about overload today and overload next week. And if I end up taking things mm -hmm. too close to failure too soon, I'm just either getting repetitive, like each week I'm not seeing any change. It's just the same for the same RAR and potentially even kind of seeing regression. I definitely, I find it happens to me most on pushing movements. Uh, I even had it this past mesocycle with my incline bench. I think I was looking at my numbers and hoping to kind of hit what I did last mesocycle, but I changed my exercise order and started doing triceps before doing my incline pressing because yeah. I wanted to prioritize triceps. So I was like, oh yeah, I can definitely maintain the same numbers. And I was like a good, if I was realistic, I was a good two reps lower. Um, or even two kilos <laughs> down on the lift. So I just ended up repeating performance for like three weeks. I was like, that was really not a smart move. I should have at least just taken it down one week to then move yeah. like one step back for two steps forward. So it's something I have to continuously catch myself with. How quickly do you find yourself changing out? Actually, like obviously if it's progressing, you're, you're going to keep it. But if it's you know, one week, three weeks, how long do you let it stall before you're like, okay, time to just eliminate this for a little while? So, hmm, good question. I think it depends on the lift and how attached to it I am. So there'd be something like a squat. I kept squats in, I only took them out the last two months, but I kept squat, a variant of squat in for, in, since like 2017, I've had it in for the whole time, but I've changed it. So I changed it from like a controlled squat to a pause squat and I had like a narrow stance squat and each one I would always have in for at least three months or three mesocycles so more like 15 weeks up to probably like six mesocycles so my straight leg deadlifts have been in for a long time now um, but now they're starting to kind of stall so generally at least yeah. three months or three mesocycles up to six um, for isolation movements I probably vary those more frequently but I almost think I shouldn't on some of them. I think it's just like a psychological boredom thing. And I rationalize that there's not so much technique yeah. learning and things like this, but I particularly think for like my abs, I almost, and calves, I just want to commit to like one flexion machine or one extension machine and just mm -hmm. be like, just focus on that actually progressively overloading. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. I definitely think ultimately if you're really gaining muscle, like there's a good discussion that's kind of happened in the last year or two, which is that, you know, before it was always like you add more weight, you add more weight. That's how you progress. And now it's kind of shifted to more like, not that that's not true, but that maybe you're looking at the order wrong. Like you progress and that allows you to add more weight. Um, now the end result is the same. You're bigger and stronger, but it's, you know, it, it's interesting because it's, it shows that it doesn't just come down to, well, just put more weight on the bar. Like maybe there's, it's okay. Okay. How do I do that? How do I get to a point that I can actually do that? And so my first comment was going to be, I think if you've gained muscle and you have the same movement, you're going to be able to lift more weight. Like you just are, if you have, I mean, you know, assuming most other factors are similar, but if you just stick with that same exercise forever, maybe that's not ideal to get that increase in muscle to then be able to. So I do think there's something to be said for saying like, okay, Clearly, I'm stalling out here. I need to do something different, whether that is just increasing the volume or changing the exercise. 
some sort of stimulus. I, I think it's a little too simplistic to just say, I'm just going to stay with the same exercise forever and progress with that. Obviously, that's not going to work. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think even from a point of, well, for longevity and health in terms of like joints and ligaments and hitting the same place over and over again, uh, which is why I ended up um, moving to like, I call it controlled high bar squat, just not really utilizing the stretch reflex at all. Cause I, I started getting to a point where I was chasing numbers and I just end up bouncing and bounce like a trampoline yeah. out of the bottom. And I was like, <laughs> I yeah. caused myself some knee and hip pain after a while. I was like, this is not, I can't keep doing this. This is not smart. And I see people doing it. And like for some people, their joints and tendons and ligaments can take a lot of beating. Mine actually can. I'm very fortunate in that way. Like I have big joints, which is sucks for bodybuilding. But in some ways it's kind of, I can take a beating and take decent hits of volume. But so longevity and like we know for like to get the best results a lot of the best bodybuilders are the ones who have been lifting the longest and um, a lot of those are the smarter lifters because they've been doing it lifting intelligently and not just kind of plowing themselves into the ground with certain movements and then also just variation from like hitting muscles at different angles right. um, not every single movement will kind of hit every single muscle fiber in the same way so i definitely see that as kind of a strategy going forward and i think long term that definitely provide the best results short term i think obviously yeah stick on the same movement getting used to it but yeah it's it's hard to kind of take it away from people sometimes they're like yeah. oh, i love this movement i just want to keep doing it uh, but i think sometimes that just bites people in the ass sure sure you mentioned briefly there about doing something i think you said like the psychological reason behind it and i think i liked your post i think it's like a couple of days ago where you're talking about you know we're not a machine and you kind of involve like the psychology and i think there's a lot to be said that because people who are like us who, I mean, even for us, it's, it's a factor, but we are very dedicated to it and very strict. And we can sometimes force ourselves to just continue to do something we might not want to do if it's going to provide the results. But as people who coach others, you have to realize that, you know, it's like, do you want to be right or do you want to get the results? You know, and you can say, hey, you can just you have to do this. This is the best way. But for a lot of people that's not going to work. I mean, even for sometimes something as basic as like macros, right? I mean, if somebody comes to me and they've literally never tracked in their life, they're 30 pounds overweight and they're like, I'm just trying to get in shape. I'm not going to start them most likely with like, hey, here's your plan, log everything, like all the time, you have to follow these exact macros. I mean, I could and some people would follow that and, be, you know, they have that initial motivation and they might follow that. But for a lot of people, that's not the best way, in my opinion, at least, to just like right out the gate have them doing that. So, I was going to ask you, what examples do you have where you've done something for the psychological benefit or just you thought psychologically is what you wanted to do, even though you knew for yourself or for a client, it wasn't the best physiological thing to do? Fantastic. So, yeah, I think it's we do. I think it has a lot of practical helpfulness to just take out psychology and just look on paper what's optimal. But you, I think, like I said in the post, you have to remember we aren't machines, even though we want to like behave and treat ourselves like machines. And I think, like you said, you probably treat yourself a bit like that. And I definitely treat myself a lot like that. So for myself, I very rarely, at least I try not to, I don't think I do. I might just be ignorant to it. Um, like let myself do something that is kind of just my preference because I want to do it that way. Um, maybe sometimes I, I could be like, I, I convince myself that it's not me being lazy. It's them overthinking it. Like mm -hmm. I could do things like this. Um, I probably need someone to assess what I'm doing and like really take a bird's eye view. But I guess mm -hmm. one indication of that would have been with Jared when I said I was going to mini cut and he was like, you shouldn't. So then right. I kind of didn't allow myself to go with what I wanted to do. And I went with what was probably right on paper. So I don't often find myself letting myself do it. And I think probably sometimes I'd be in a better position if I did. Mm -hmm. Um, but with clients, I definitely have uh, actually someone who recently signed up. He's been with me for a few months now. And he came from like a background of like JP, Jordan Peters kind of uh, okay. training very high intensities. Low, actually, he didn't train low volume. He was quite, uh, quite high volume, high intensities, take everything, everything to failure. Right. Uh, and kind of very against kind of gaining body weight and body fat and bit kind of adipose phobia. Um, so... Yeah, with him, I, I just transitioned it. So it was a case of, right, typically with a new with a client who is bought into what I we do at Revive Stronger and they understand the process and they kind of know what they're going to get before they even see the program. I can start them at like three to four reps reserve, minimum effective volume, and they're cool. 
But for someone like him, if I saw him at three to four reps in reserve, he would have literally, I know he just would have spat it back out and been like, right. no way. <laughs> so I tried to do like a two reps in reserve in the, for the first mesocycle. And then we'd like progress from two to two to one to one to zero and then like a failure week. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I just know the ability to progress through that and add volume is just difficult with that sort of system. Right. It doesn't leave as much room for progression, I don't feel. So in the next mesocycle is then, can we start this at like three to two? So then we tried that and he was like, I, you wrote three to two, but I didn't take anything to three. So it was like at two. So mm -hmm. at the moment we're still starting mesocycles at two reps in reserve, okay. which is much better than where he was taking everything to all out failure every week. So whilst he knows that isn't the best for him necessarily on paper physiologi physiologically, psychologically it's what he is kind of having to do to be able to enjoy training and he right, wouldn't right. do any training if he couldn't do that so yeah. yeah that's definitely an example where i've had to come to terms with people's preferences rather than like what i think they should be doing right do you tend to end most mesocycles at near failure like pretty much right there so for myself i kind of know and probably you do as well dave where like naught reps and reserve is you know if you've got another rep or not. I can yeah. virtually always tell. I sometimes push it right to the edge on like a bench press or something where I'm like, yeah. ah, it's going to be so close. But I normally <laughs> like just get that rep. Yeah. And normally that's just my ego. That rep's just for my ego. I know like, mm -hmm. I know I've probably got it. Do I really get much like extra from doing it? Not really. It's probably yeah. not worth the risk, but right. like I just tend to take it because I just want <laughs> I want, I just want to do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, with I don't often actually like concentrically fail or like rack things. I say not often, like that just very barely ever happens. I don't right. make a rep. It's typically I leave everything where I'm like, that was my last solid repetition. If I tried for any more, I know either form would go out the window or I've just like something bad would happen. For like my hip hinges um, and maybe squats, I'm a bit more cautious. I say on squats, I do pretty much take it there because mm -hmm. again, I'm probably got a bit of ego within the squat whereas for like a straight leg deadlift or romanian deadlift i really just i know as soon as my mind muscle connection has kind of gone on that or my back's starting to round my knees are starting to bend like i can just feel that that's starting to creep in yeah. or on like a bent over row i think for, the, for rowing movements generally like they're very safe to take to failure and probably right. like you just end up using momentum or you shorten your range of motion and i try to film those because i might feel like the reps were terrible or they might have felt okay and it's just good to have that kind of objective look mm -hmm. typically with a, a row like bent over rows in particular because of the strength curve it gets incredibly tempting especially when you're pushing to failure to start using momentum to help that kind of top right. end of the lift Definitely. and i kind of have a i did a post on the other day where i'm like i kind of came to the realization i need a bit of smudge factor for that otherwise i just end up becoming way too anal and like it has to be perfect form and i end up just yeah for rows in particular yeah. um so i like a little bit of like as long as you're feeling it in the muscle group and it's not looking like a complete jerk or anything i'm okay with that getting a little bit like that as then you can neaten it up later so yeah, yeah i, I, I do tend to take actually, most of these there i was gonna ask about one of the like what movements you do allow a little more lax form with because i think rows is a great one and that's a very common one i remember back geez that was probably like my first first two years of like 12 years ago and i was posting with like you know horrible camera the uh i was doing like a row and i was posting on a forum and everybody was saying you know oh man you had so much more left in you you had like another five reps and but i was trying to keep it perfect form and so and like in the video you would think that because that last like two or three inches of a row is so weak i feel like that like you know i'm trying to just pull it in there so yeah, the first like 90% of this range of motion is very easy, or yeah, I mean, it's relatively easy, but then that last bit, I'm trying to keep a perfect form. And I'm not saying that's not going to grow muscle, but I don't feel like that, that same strength curve is there when I do like a cable row. I mean, it obviously is still harder at the very peak, but something about like the barbell row, I just feel like I have to use such light weight to get that like perfect contraction at the top. And I can literally add like 30% more weight and most of the range of motion is still doable if I just kind of put a little oomph into it. So I think rows is, is a great example. I don't know if you have other exercises that you do that with. Yeah, I think it's, you have to know yourself. So if I was doing it for like a newer client, 
I'd be very conscious of them having pretty damn good form. And if they were more advanced, that's when I'm like, okay, ask them, did you actually feel that in the muscle group? Um, did mm-hmm. you actually feel that in your back? And hopefully they say they do. And then I'm like, okay, like we can have that little smudge factor. Um, because yeah, I feel like it, you know, if it was with your back or if you started bringing in other muscle groups and you were just fatiguing yourself and not providing the stimulus where you wanted to with the row and only when you're more advanced. Um, so other lifts, I think maybe like a dumbbell lateral raise again, the strength curve on that isn't ideal. So when like you get to the top, it can be quite difficult. Um, same with upright rows as well. I'm not kind of thinking, I might use it as a variation where you like pause at the top with like a dumbbell row or an upright row, even maybe a bent over at some point, just like if someone's form was really out, you're just like, right, yeah. let's just pause that top portion now. But I think with those movements, just because of the, yeah, the, the strength curve there, if you just use a little bit of momentum, it kind of like the natural sway of the body just allows the kind of strength curve to be in a bit more of an equalized position. And you're not you're not using other muscle groups. You're just kind of using the natural yeah, sway of the body in that sense. I think right, same with like right. bicep curls sometimes. You just kind of, it's almost hard to not sway um, yeah, sometimes. Sure. It's like to actually get the weight. And so long as you're feeling it in the muscle group and it's enhancing your mind-muscle connection, I think that's okay. And you can be consistent with it. I think the trouble is when like you start kind of letting inconsistencies come in and then it's like, how do you track that? How do you monitor that you're actually progressing? Yeah, for sure. I, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned kind of getting a consult with Jared Feather. Um, and I know obviously you and the RP guys, like they talk a lot or you guys talk a lot. It's also interesting when you see two coaches kind of consulting with each other, which you see quite a bit either within, you know, one team, like with like maybe you and Pascal or 3DMJ. I know they all kind of help each other out. Um, I don't know how long Jared's been lifting, probably about as long as you, right? I think he started really young, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, and he's obviously massive, especially now. And yeah. I think he he and Mike are pretty open about, you know, what they use and all that. So do you find, and of course, I mean, I think hopefully people recognize that just because some of these enhancement doesn't mean that they don't have knowledge. If you look at somebody like me, Lyle but McDonald, he obviously doesn't have the best genetics in terms of lifting. He's very knowledgeable being cynical that nothing matters after like five years and this doesn't matter and this doesn't matter three percent difference on somebody who can hold 50 pounds more muscle mass you know okay you might notice that versus if somebody who has horrible genetics that three percent difference it might feel like they haven't gained anything so i don't know if you have noticed that kind of trend as well with people who are enhanced or just really genetically gifted yeah I, it's it's a hard one to put a finger on i think definitely people and i've noticed it with myself and I, I you notice it in others where their bias is a little bit with their own experience and what they've seen sure. with their set of clientele which is always going to be the case but i think it's like further emphasized in kind of when people have had more extreme like view sets i even think it's I, it was i was thinking about it the other day where sometimes i'll see very very genetically gifted people talk about their training and kind of giving advice and it's incredibly basic and simple is like just train hard like simply mm. and they they think other people like myself are over thinking it and are like doing it as like a marketing thing and i right. find that personally very frustrating because and you probably would as well because just training yeah. hard is poor advice for us because we just would get nowhere with that but then obviously they will have clients that also get great results with just train hard but I think probably right. the people who are very gifted want to be coached by someone who is also looks the part and is very gifted because they kind of, yeah. a lot of my clients, like, like without saying thing arrogant, kind of look up to me in that sense. They're like, I kind of want to have a physique like Steve or do similar mm-hmm. things that Steve's done. And I think probably the same for them. So it's almost like maybe I see those coaches doing well with other clients because they just attract genetic elites because they're a genetic elite and they kind of form a, a group. Absolutely. And it's kind of like then you're biased by your own experiences through your clients. So it's such a yeah, hard one yeah. to kind of it's, eke out. It's definitely <laughs> an echo chamber for sure. You know, you have that's exactly the case because people who want to work with me are usually people who say, okay, I want something that's sustainable. I want to look good, but I'm not looking to be like a complete freak or like win, you know, like a national powerlifting competition or something like that, right? So those people are going to come to me and they're going to eat up my advice and they're going to maybe want to look like how I look or something like that. 
And then that's going to continue my bias thinking, yeah, this is the right way to do it. Oh, and exactly. I mean, genetic freaks typically want somebody like they look insane. So they're not going to take advice from me because they're probably going to say, well, what do you know? You know, and yeah. not everyone's like that. Obviously, it's a generalization, but it, that does seem to be the case. You know, um, I think every once in a while you see something maybe a little contrary to that. Like, didn't did Jordan Peters work with Pascal? Did I see something about that? So um, Pascal helped him with his coach, uh, with his programming. I think Pascal had like access okay. to his program and they were going back and forth over WhatsApp and talking through yeah, okay. how, how to basically, because it was the first time Jordan was using like reps and reserve and um, any okay. sort of volume landmark type of system. So yeah, Pascal was helping him with that. Yeah. And, and I don't know Jordan, but from what I understand, I mean, he's a openly enhanced, like pretty huge guy, yeah. right? So that's, that's maybe like, contradictory to what we were just saying where you have this guy who is enhanced you know huge on steroids and everything and he's talking to pascal who from everything i've seen he's definitely not enhanced and he, you know it's a very different platform so that's one of those kind of counter examples but i think in general what you're saying is definitely accurate yeah yeah it's it was really great to see jordan do that um yeah it's cool i'm it's kind of a bit miffed that it didn't go any longer than like the four weeks that they ended up doing it because I feel like there could have been something there and that really yeah. could have, I don't know, not revolutionized things, but that could have been a case where, I don't know, Jordan, maybe not to say he's a very deep thinker as well. So it's very hard to use Jordan as an example, but imagine if he was just like, oh, I've just got great results, always just training hard. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the science says. I know he's very open to the science, which is why he did it in the first place. But it could have yeah. been a case where it's like, oh, that first branching out. And I think probably him doing that did lead to a few people thinking about it a bit more and considering it. So I don't know if it's a time thing, like a ge eventually the genetic elite are going to get smart and it's going to be like, holy yeah. shit. <laughs> right, uh, right. Now those guys look like they're on drugs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It is one of those things where you wonder, is it ever going to change? You know, there's just such a culture in bodybuilding that's just this way and it's perpetuated by people who think the same way. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. It is interesting how I, I know people who, like, I'll meet them in the gym or something, and they're clearly enhanced and have no idea who, like, 3 J is or anything like that. And how do you not know who Eric Helms is? You know, it's just funny, like, the different worlds, you know. Yeah, it's, there was one, I had an interview with um, Terrence Ruffin. So he's, like, I think he's five foot six. He's on stage at, like, I think 160 pounds. He's enhanced. But he's, like, okay. or he might be five five. He's, like, insane, like, incredible physique. And I interviewed him and he like keeps his eyes in both. Like he was, he came from more of the kind of bro set and he's like had his eyes opened a little bit towards more of the evidence based and science set. So it's really interesting seeing someone like that kind of mm -hmm. get a bit of both. And he is someone who's like genetically yeah. a freak. So it's really amazing to see him get influenced by it. And I'm sure it's in like enhance his results and his physique. So it's, it's yeah, crazy to see, but also part of me is like, well, maybe the genetic elite have to train that way to get the best results. And maybe yeah. like, that's just so special that that's what works. And maybe it's just because there's no science yeah. on them to show that that's the way. <laughs> that's kind of like the disheartening thing is I think, I think that's probably true. I think that for them, I really don't think that if Phil Heath with all the genetics, like the crazy genetics, all the gear he's using, all of that, if you told me, hey, like he's going to be trained by like Mike Isertel, Mike Isertel is going to take him through the RIR and all these like landmarks and everything. Do I think we would have seen an even more impressive Phil Heath? Not really. I mean, maybe a little bit. You might have a different opinion. And that's nothing to be said against Mike Isertel at all. It's just, I think when you're that much of a freak and you're on that many drugs, I just don't know if like those details matter as much or even really at all when it's like that level you know i mean you literally have studies where people use steroids and they're you know their gains are destroying the people who are training they're not even training and they're just getting way people who are training so you combine that with freak freak genetics and 10 times that level of gear you start to wonder if <laughs> if like any of those other things that for like a natural would matter for them and, and then that's going to just perpetuate it forever really because steroids aren't going to go away so yeah no, I mean, I, part of me doesn't want to agree that that's the case, <laughs> that that would be it. Like, part of me is like, no, it would, Mike would make him huge. But uh, right, I think, right. like, my logical brain is telling me I've seen people, even naturals, who 
I look at them and I'm like, you're training. I wouldn't want to show any of my clients your training. It's trash. Yeah. Like, it's really not good. But they're flipping jacked and they're probably more jacked than I'm ever going to be. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, if they can right. really do that and be that jacked, like, that's just crazy. And I think it was um, Scott Stevenson. I asked him about it and he brought up an example of this guy that was like, bench pressing what everyone was deadlifting after like a few months with hit like with his yeah. friends it was just like he's like genetics matter so much there's some people just right on that out like outliers and they just grow from anything he told me maybe the same guy he told me there was a guy who his first time benching at like 15 years old and like I, scott just does not seem like a guy who would ever like lie about this sort of thing he said he I think he said he was there and it was like in the 300s his first time ever benching it's just like <laughs> incomprehensible to me that, that, that I think he was 15 I'm pretty sure that's it's just insane. like some people man it, it's it's really unbelievable it's crazy but those are those are the guys the guy who you know was doing like a thousand pound bench press he was that guy you know it's not just some people would just never even get close to that obviously so yeah so the last thing I wanted to wrap up with is just when you're looking at these people because you said some people come to you as like as a coach and they'll maybe want to look up to you or some people are doing styles very differently. But the guy who came to you and he was pushing everything to failure, you worked with him and you, you know, kind of got him on a different path. At what point or what factors do you look at and say like, OK, you know, we're probably just not a good fit. You know, it's like you're not even going to take it to the point of trying to improve it. It's just like, you know, we're probably not going to work well together. No, a great question, because this does unfortunately happen and it's a little bit upsetting for me at least and I think probably the more experience I get with it the more I realize you just you can't be the best coach and fit for everyone but it'll be yep. where and it's happened a few times with him and it's happened with other clients where they start doing things I haven't prescribed or they change what I'm prescribing and if that happens and I tell them and I'm like you I'm your coach like I don't want to be a dictator but please, if you're going to change anything, ask me first at least and like so we can talk things through because otherwise, what's the point of me doing this? And if they're not open right. to that discussion, um, then that's where I'm like, I, they're just not workable um, if they won't listen and you can't have a like down, like really honest discussion. And the great thing with him is he is very, he, he realizes and he's like, this is exactly why I wanted you as my coach yeah. because I need you to rein me in because if I'm left in my to my own ways, I will just revert back to what I was doing before. So yeah, unfortunately, I think some people just aren't coachable, or I'm not the right coach for them, at least. Right, right, makes sense. And yeah, I um, for me, it's I will always, and it sounds like generally you guys will try, and then if they don't follow what you're saying, I would say that's usually the case for me too. I'll I'll take on most people. The only time I won't is if it's something that. I just don't feel like I'm the most appropriate person like for like guidance. Like I said, like I have not, I mean, I've gotten very lean, but I have not gone through the actual competition phase, right? Of actually, you know, putting on the tanner and, get, and like that might be, you know, even Best if fit. I've gotten close, right, exactly. <laughs> and getting the thong and everything, you know, <laughs> see, I got to relate to them and know how embarrassing it is to have that thong on, it, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but I, I do think that that's important. Um, I don't think you need to be, the best in the world to coach somebody, but I think you should have at least done it. And so if it's something that I haven't done, I'll just say, look, like, you know, there's somebody who has been through that process who might help. But frankly, that, that's a pretty small percentage. I mean, at least most people I talk to, I mean, I'm sure you get a lot of people who do want to compete. That's probably why they're coming to you. But for me, a lot of people, they just want to get really lean. Or they want a, a sustainable approach. Maybe they've had an issue with like food that they just have a bad relationship with food or they're struggling in a certain way. Um, so most people who come to me, I, I I find I can help pretty well, but sometimes it's just like, hey, man, like I'm probably not the best person for that. Okay. So I'll just let them know. Yeah. 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 I think that's the best way to be. Just be very honest about your skill set and what you're able to do and like where you've been, because you might find someone's like, OK, I understand you haven't gone to stage, but I love you. I think you're a great fit for me. I trust you and I want to do it with you anyway. And, and then you can decide if you want to go ahead with it. But right. I certainly had that. Um, with, I can remember my first female competitor and I was like, this is where my comfort zone. I'm never going to be female. I'm never going to train the way a female trains. I don't know, man. It's 2019. You <laughs> it's can be true. anything you want. <laughs> I'm, I could, could well decide I have like a midlife crisis and I want to be a girl now. So that can happen. But yeah, so even like the posing, at least I can outsource the posing. That's right. something I was very happy with. But just training females, like it's it's just quite different and training like specifically for bikini it's like well they emphasize 
it's easy for a bodybuilder. You just want everything as jacked as possible. But for bikini, it's yeah. like, well, they want glutes, shoulders, and a bit of back. It's yeah. like, okay, well, we're not doing any cable flies or like dumbbell bench press. It's like, maybe not. It's like, oh, right. okay. So for my first female competitor, I was very open and like, I was like, I don't know if I'm the best person for you because I've never taken any one stage, but I really wanted to coach her because I was like, I need that experience. So yeah, I was yeah. like, if you want to find another coach, you can. And she trusted me. And now I've worked with, I don't know, almost as many females to stage as men now, which is really cool. Wow. Um, but it, it is still different. And um, when I have people that come to me who I just recently had someone who was referred to me from someone who had been coached by me before and she wasn't really aware of us that much and how we do things particularly so I was very conscious of that so in her like initial check-in I was like going through everything in so yeah. much like explaining every little thing so I was like I need you to be brought into this process otherwise right. it's it, we're not gonna meld well because she like come a lot of females come from like I don't know different programming and yeah females I think they just come from a real mix of things like you yeah. never really it can be a bit of a yeah a mishmash Definitely, definitely. Awesome, man. So where can people find all of your stuff? Cool. So uh, everything's at revivestronger.com. Um, I'm at Revive Stronger on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. And then probably the best place um, if people want to kind of interact with other people within the community is the Revive Stronger Facebook group. And if they listen to the podcast, they can also get in there and ask Mike their question, which is always great. Right. Awesome, man. Thanks for talking. Yeah, thank you so much.